off the phone. <laughs> I have to off my sound. Okay, here we go again. Sorry about that. Hello, this is Wazwo X Wazwo, and once again I'm in Baroda. And I'm sitting today with none other than Alexander Gorditsky, who's an artist I greatly admire. And he's been working in India with Indian artists for longer than I have, I believe. Um, I think we should start with you just telling a little bit about your background. Probably. Sure, sure. I was. Well, thank you for this. Okay. I'm really happy to speak to you. Um, I grew up in London, and uh, my mother was a dealer in Central Asian textiles, so she would travel to Afghanistan and Pakistan and India, and every once in a while I would accompany her. So I was really kind of absorbed by that material. Then when I was in my early 20s, I traveled fairly extensively, mainly in Pakistan and, and India, and just got really kind of interested in kind of working methods, working materials here and started to incorporate that into, into my own work. And your main collaborator is? Riazuddin, who's uh, an artist I met 25 years ago, and we've been working for that, for that amount of time. And we have become very close friends. He's traveled to America, to, to the UK, and next year hopefully he's going to come to Germany. So we've kind of established this relationship. Um, and when I met him 25 years ago, he was already an incredibly gifted artist. Um, he was copying miniatures, you know, for, for, the, yeah, yeah. for the tourist market. Yeah. Rias is your RVJ. That's my, my collaborator. Right, yes. yeah, yeah. OK. Yeah. So when I look at your work, and <laughs> first of all, you may not like this comparison, but I mm -hmm. see it so strongly. It has a real Sgt. Pepper quality. Right. And I know I'm dating myself uh -huh. with that, sort of a Sgt. Pepper yellow submarine. This is the old Beatles, if you're not young enough to remember this mm -hmm. quality. But I really love that because mm -hmm. I lived during those right. times and I, it was just like it brings back that happy mm -hmm. feeling when mm -hmm. I look at it. Um, but one time when I spoke to you, you do. Um, you do um, miniature paintings and you also do painted photographs. Right. Um, and one time I referred to some of your works as collage-like and you didn't like that at all. You told mm. me that you did like my use of the word of collage because I think mm. you were thinking of it in the specific use of the term. But I meant like collaging of different elements from different historical periods and whatever, bringing them together. Right, right. Do you, do you see that's a part that of your is work? Very, that's very appropriate. Yeah, that's really, mm. I'm, I'm pulling things from all sorts of different sources. Um, I'm very liberal in, in, in that way and it could be from Japanese kimonos to Syrian tiles to Victorian lace. Um, in that respect, it, it very much is collage. It's kind of layering, overlayering um, different elements and different visual languages as well. Um, so in the same image, you might find something that's kind of redolent of kind of Western minimalism and something else that's kind of like a, a R. Crumb cartoon. Uh, and I'm really kind of mixing them together. I especially see that Sergeant Pepper feel when I look at some of your hand-painted photographs mm -hmm. that because of the photographs being basically people standing up in rows right. and then you've added all this fun material on top of it, it becomes like the cover of Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. Right, right. You know, and it's, uh, but it's fun. It's just really a great thing. I think do. in a way the, there's something about formality that's kind of inviting um, to kind of be kind of undermined or to be, um, you know, added on to. Um, so that's what I do. The, the vintage photographs, I mean, people are very, I think they're never smiling at all. Um, so it's kind of a way of, of taking that on a journey. And I think that relates to a lot of the work that I'm, I'm doing. It's just kind of, I don't think of it as original. I think of it as moving on, you know, taking it from one place and going on a, on a, on a journey to somewhere else. And, and you also seem to be very, very fascinated with patterning. Um, some of your paintings are actually almost totally patterning in yes. some ways. I, they get very abstract. Um, they become almost like um, 
New York school abstraction in some right, ways, right. in a certain way. And I know mm -hmm. you're based in New York mm -hmm. now, which has probably influenced you. But do you want to talk about your, your patterning influences? I think that's more closely related to the textiles I was surrounded with. I mean, if you think about, um, you know, kind of Uzbeki cats and then, um, you know, kind of lacai embroideries and uh, Hazara, Hazara handkerchiefs or whatever, those are patterns that I've been around. And I, I, I do remember as a child just looking at patterns and shapes that are kind of just, they really are, they're, they're shifting. And once you overlay them, so the aim isn't actually to make something particularly beautiful, but it's, it's just to see how patterns can contrast. Um, and I think of myself, I refer to myself as a pattern farmer. Yeah, um, you're the pattern farmer. Pattern farmer, yes. Pattern I'm, kind of, farmer. I'm kind of cultivating patterns, I suppose. And, um, you know, when you look at an Indian miniature painting, they often have, you know, one or two focal points. But when you look at the background, or you look at the cushions, or you look at the border, there's so much going on there. And I right. think, in a way, that's been more, that's often more fascinating for me than the theme of the, of the painting. Um, but the other part of that is just kind of moving in between the narrative and the abstract. Um, you know, sometimes getting interested in storytelling, and other times really eschewing storytelling and finding something that's purely purely visual, and I, I don't really differentiate between, between the two. Yeah, I was like, um, I was thinking about your patterns, and I, I guess one question I have with the patterns, are you directly lifting patterns from old sources and reproducing them in your works, or do you invent your own patterns? I mean, a lot of your patterns are invented, right? They don't yeah. seem like anything that would be familiar to me. Yeah, you know, I, I, honestly, at this point, I don't know what I've lifted from other sources and what's, what's mine, and I don't... You know, I think once you find a pattern and then you can modify it, you know, you incorporate some other element into it. So. I don't really know. I mean, I, I'm, I draw a lot. I spend a lot of time drawing, and when you do it enough, you do kind of, I come up with patterns all the time. But I don't know that they haven't been kind of influenced or even kind of taken from other, other sources. Alexander gave a very nice walking tour through the gallery last night for a select group, and I really enjoyed that, but you very much impressed me with your knowledge of art history when you could talk about the different images that you've inserted from various historical miniature painting traditions and how they relate to each other in the new construct that you've made as the painting right. with Rias. And that's something I really couldn't do because sometimes when I borrow imagery from other sources it's in this totally playful way, mm -hmm. you know, and I was actually a little afraid before our show at Gallery of Spas because we were part of a talk with Annapurna Garamella and I was afraid people were going to start asking me about, well, what miniature is that a reference from? And I had to do some cramming before right. I had to make sure I remembered <laughs> yeah. what it was. But I, I also see a lot of playfulness in your work. I mean, I think your work is basically playful. Um, um, I, I uh, thank you. Yeah, I, I take play very seriously. <laughs> you take play very seriously. <laughs> I do. Seriously. I do. You know, I mean, when you watch children playing, right, it's a really important activity. It's there's nothing. I think people think of play as something um, that's kind of very, very light and kind of almost irrelevant, and it's it's really not. You know, and I think in a way, kind of as you get older that sense of play and that sense of make and it's really to do with kind of making connections and flipping things around and maybe kind of finding something humorous about them in a way becomes more and more important so you know i don't i take my work very seriously but i, I don't think i take myself too seriously is there yeah. is there any like deeper subtext below beneath this veneer of play or no are there are there like deeper meanings well, if you I, probe a little further, yeah, I mean, I'm, sh I'm sure there are, but I mean, I think that's also true of play, you know. So, um, I, you know, I don't. So, I'd question the idea of play being a veneer, actually. But um, yeah, there are there are there are references that are kind of meaningful to me. Um, but I think part what's kind of important for me in the work is that the meanings that I might have 
are going to be different to the ones that you yes. might read. So I always feel that the, the viewer is the meaning maker. You know, I, I don't make meanings for people. I make my own, but I'm really, I'm kind of willing people to kind of find their own interpretation. Yeah, through play, you sort of encourage people to explore their own subconscious. The yeah. subconscious comes to the fore when you look at some of these images and you remember your childhood dreams mm. sometimes. I, I hope so, and I, I like the idea that the same image will change over time so that someone might have a reading of it one day and then come back to it kind of two weeks later and see something completely different. So let's talk a little bit about your, um, your working process with RIAS because it's a little different than my working process with RVJ. Do you just want to explain mm. like you did last night a little bit about the working process? Sure. Um, well, Riaz, as I said, when I first met him, um, he was kind of within the tourist market, and that's really how 99% of miniaturist painters make a living. They're making copies of copies of copies. When did you start working with him? It was 24 years ago. 24 yeah, years ago, yeah. okay. Um, next year's our silver anniversary. Okay. <laughs> um, so I really, I'd, I'd already been working with um, Pakistani, you know, with a forger, and actually Afghan forgers in Pakistan and knitters and shoemakers and spectacle repairmen, um, embroiderers, always with the idea of seeing how a craft, what's called craft, um, can be redirected, you know, and just I had drawings and they would be re, you know, it's kind of essentially kind of art directing, I suppose and was very interested in working with a miniature painter and was lucky enough to be introduced to Riaz who was an exceptionally gifted young artist who had developed the skills um, but there was no interest in imagining new, new, new images you know so the idea was really to kind of redirect his skill towards my own imagery and at first it started as a design project, really, just for, for, for illustrations. Over time, it started kind of getting back into my work or coming into my work. Um, so essentially, every work is very, very carefully um, designed by me. And in some ways, I'm designing paintings. Um, so the, the, paper, the choice of paper, the orientation, obviously the narrative, if there is one, the color schemes, the patterns, all of that really happens at my end. And Riaz, and then there's now a studio, you know, it's a studio of about six people um, in the studio, and then there are a couple of other people we work with outside. So they're really given a set of instructions, and in a way, there's not that much variations. But however, you know, whatever degree I will design to, things always look differently. Um, and the works really go back and forth, you know, so he sends things to the States, you know, my studio's in New York, and then I work on it, and then it goes back. So from start to finish, a piece might take, you know, two, three, even four years. I find um, that fascinating that you physically ship the work back and forth when you're in New York. That's yeah. a very hands-on process mm -hmm. because I'm basically in Udaipur all the time, so mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm there right. with the artists as they're painting, and I mm -hmm. can kind of hover a little mm -hmm. bit and check on how things are going. Yeah. And uh, but when I'm away, when I'm in Bangkok, which is my other home, um, we do it on WhatsApp. Right. We don't physically send work back and forth. Yeah. He sends me images on WhatsApp, but there's a limitation to that because there are times where it's just like you just can't really get a feel of what's going right. on. It's like I've got to go back to India. I, I'll just say stop it, just stop it until I get mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. because you need to hold it in your hand. Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's funny. We think of these as, as flat images, but there's so much in kind of the texture and the tone and the, um, you know, the consistency of the color, particularly if you're using... Um, natural pigments, you know, they don't always dry flat. We do also work digitally. I mean, I'll, he'll send me images, we'll send WhatsApp. So it's not, it's not completely, um, you know, kind of in front of me, but pretty much, you know, most of the time. And that's partly because when we started working, we barely had computers to work with. Right. Um, or I just didn't understand. I remember much. those days. Yeah, yes. yeah. So, um, days before email. That's right. You know, and so I think in a way that was my grounding um, of working with, with Riaz. But he's, he's got to know me so well and vice versa. But now, in, in many cases, the instructions are kind of less specific. 
but I think that's partly because you know he, he kind of he has a people sense learn of what you want and so you don't have to be so hands-on anymore because yeah you no know, Rakesh Rakesh knows what Chacha wants right expects, right yeah know? so now you know there's that growth process yeah and also I'm kind of interested happens. in seeing how Riaz or Papu that's one of the other artists who's an incredible painter of these geometric forms he does freehand and he's, he's he lives with this kind of library of of very very intricate um, geometrical designs so sometimes when I'll ask for four geometric designs I won't know specifically which ones they are um, and in that respect I am kind of responding to you know to kind of their I'm going to ask you something difficult mm. and I mean this is a relation with my own art because I've been I have a lot of supporters and I have my fan base, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. But I also have detractors and mm -hmm. it's like I've gotten jumped on sometimes quite seriously by people who say that I'm just exploiting these people, you know, mm -hmm. that I'm just exploiting these mm -hmm. craftsmen. And I'm like, God, I always put their names up. I always mm -hmm. make sure they get paid fairly. Mm -hmm. Whenever we make a sale, they get a bonus on the sale. Mm -hmm. To me, I'm treating people very fairly. Um, how do you relate? Do you get those criticisms at all or no? Um, you know, we're not directly. Um, so it'd have to be, you know, I'd have to respond to something specific. You know, I, I think in a way you'd have to ask Riaz, you know, you'd have to ask the, the artists in the studio how they feel about it. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable, you know, I think it's, it's, um, it's been, I think, a very I think, you know, I shouldn't speak for Riaz, but I think it's been a pretty rewarding experience for him and the artists right. working in the studio. But, you know, I don't, I don't object to those criticisms. I think they're, you know, I think my artists, My artists never complain. I mean, they all seem very happy working with me. Yeah, and I yeah. treat them nicely. I mean, I just flew everybody to the Indy Art Fair. Right. We all fly together when we go to his shows. So I'll yeah. fly them, I put them up in a nice hotel, all that. Yeah. We do, we do things as a group. Yeah. I consider I us like the rock band. Right, right. You know, so. Yeah. I you know, I, I you know, people I think people often take offense on someone else's behalf. Yes. You know? So it's worth asking if they are offended personally and then talking about and that. And not but assume that they are. Yeah, not, you know, I mean I think in a sense it's an, it's an odd assumption that Riaz would be willing or allowed to be exploited because he's bloody smart you know yeah, 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 <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. and uh, so I think it's it's kind of an odd idea that he's kind of you know he's naive enough to be exploited or he's kind of desperate enough you know I mean he I would say he does he does pretty well right, there's so. sometimes an assumption that the people you're working with only because they're Indian, like that they're so, they so lack agency that like they don't know how to put food on their table and they're totally dependent on you and that's not the case at all. Right. You know, it's yeah. like Rakesh is quite solidly middle class and you know, he, yeah. he doesn't need me, he chooses to work with me. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I mean, yeah. that's, a, that's a part of my defense. Another thing that often creeps in, I'm touching on the hard subjects now, mm. what about this whole issue of exoticism because sometimes that gets brought up also mm -hmm. especially when you're a foreign artist and you're working with Indian or Asian motifs right um, you know again I, it, it hasn't come up that much directly so it's presumably it's 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 said you know behind my back um, and I welcome the conversation you know I think it's um, Again, it's based on certain kind of assumptions about who you are and who's being kind of culturally appropriated. I mean, that, I suppose that term comes up, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't, you know, I, I don't think of culture as monolithic. Um, I think appropriation depends partly on intent and kind of how, you know, whether you kind of respect the, the, the culture you're kind of borrowing from, um, whether you're giving anything back. So. It's a conversation to be had. I, you know, I don't feel like. Um, I, I suppose again, it depends on. You know, I think one needs to be specific. You know, again, it's kind of who. You know, who you're speaking for. Who's the question they're speaking for? Right. Who do they identify with? Um, yeah, so I can't actually. Sometimes can't. it depends on the particular case, but I generally defend. I say that. Exoticism is a very relevant term, and what's exotic to me might mm -hmm. not be exotic to somebody else, mm -hmm. and vice versa. So, 
you know, if Indians who travel to Chicago, say, might find, you know, the Trump Tower to be mm -hmm. very exotic, mm -hmm. you know, um, which it is, <laughs> um, which I would just say, well, I grew up with that. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and um, I think that, that because of that, it's very hard to, like, claim certain aspects of a culture only for that culture. I mean, in the end, all culture becomes sort of world culture in our globalized world, you know. Um, so you, yeah, you can put the British teapot in there and also have the peacock in the background. And, right, right. Well, um, you know, it's, um, you know, I think what one person's exoticism is another person's kind of cultural discourse. You know, and um, I think if if the people who really mattered felt that something was being used inappropriately, I'd really worry about that. You right. know, so for example, in the studio, does, there have been a couple of. Does Rias guide you a little on that? Because Rakesh does that with me. Rakesh sometimes guides me and says, "No, Chacha, don't do that. People yeah. won't like it." Right. When I have an idea of a certain juxtaposition or something that I want to do, right. or a certain narrative I want to tell, sometimes Rakesh says, "No, Chacha." Yeah. You know, yeah. and then he'll explain why. Right. right. Why right. that would give offense or whatever. Which sometimes I'm just clueless about. I yeah. really don't. Yeah. The, understand. Uh, you know, religious. Really sensibilities, sexual sensibilities have been touched every once in a while, but um, again Riaz is incredibly pragmatic about these things, you know, and he'll, you know, this is a country where you'll have a, you know, a goddess with a thousand eyes, you know, it's, there's not much I can do that's going to really kind of startle people. But yeah, there, there have been a couple of occasions, you know, just um, where certain deities have been used, and then of course I'll, I'll, I'll modify that. Okay. Yeah. Alexander Gorlitsky, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much. You. It's lovely to and talk to you. Good luck with your show here in Baroda at Gallery Arc. Thank you. We are with Alexander Gorlitsky. This is Wazo X Wazo, Evil O. And once again, please keep this channel going by subscribing and liking. Okay, that really helps the channel a lot. And thank you for being here. Bye. Thank you, Wazo. Okay. Great.